So thank you all for coming. Um, let me begin by asking you to silence or turn off your cell phones, please. And while you're doing that, um, let me introduce myself and then our speaker today. My name is Zia Mian. I'm um, a physicist, and I am with the Program on Science and Global Security here in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Um, and I am especially honored to have been asked to introduce our speaker today, His Excellency Yukio Hatoyama, who served as Japan's Prime Minister from uh, 2009 and 2010. It's a special honor for many reasons, one of which is that before going into politics in 1986, our speaker studied engineering at the University of Tokyo and has a PhD from Stanford in engineering. And he was a professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology and at Senshu University in Japan. It is not often that you get people with PhDs in serious subjects becoming <laughs> heads of government. <laughs> so for all of the students out there, no matter what you are studying, there is hope. <laughs> and as head of the Democratic Party of Japan, Dr. Hatoyama led what was an opposition party to a commanding and historically unprecedented electoral victory over the Liberal Democratic Party, which had ruled Japan almost continuously since 1955. It was an amazing shift in the structure of Japanese politics. And another reason why I'm especially honored to be asked to introduce him is that he then resigned from office over a matter of principle that he had promised in his election campaign to deal with US demands to construct a new US military base in Okinawa. And when he was unable to deliver on this promise, he resigned from office. This is an amazing thing for an elected official to do, to accept that you have made a commitment to the people who voted for you and that you are held accountable to your promises. Along with being a man of extraordinary principle, Dr. Hatayama offered a new vision for Japan and for the region. And he was especially outspoken in recognizing the importance of history and responsibility, two of the things that are particularly important in our age. One of the things he did was to apologize for Japanese war crimes. Uh, both in China and in South Korea, and to recognize the existence of territorial disputes that Japan had with other countries. And now, Dr. Hatoyama is in the United States in part to highlight the need for a peaceful resolution of the situation with North Korea and the need for a new cooperative future for East Asia. And as I'm sure all of you know, this is a set of issues that could not be more important right now. We should not forget that the United States and North Korea have the bloodiest history of conflict of any two countries with nuclear weapons. Many people here are too young to remember and may not have learned that during the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, the US and its allies fought first to roll back North Korea's effort to reunify the peninsula by force, but then to invade and occupy uh, North Korea. Over three million North Koreans were killed in this war. Three million. And a million South Koreans died and China, which came to North Korea's aid, lost a million people in that war. And 35,000 American soldiers died. 
And there is no other pair of nuclear armed states that have a history of direct conflict on this scale. And now both of them are armed with nuclear weapons, and we have a crisis that is scaring many people in the United States and in the Korean Peninsula and in Japan and around the world. And as you all know, North Korea has made major advances in its nuclear program, and its nuclear weapons now threaten not just cities in South Korea and Japan, but also are imminently expected to threaten cities in the United States, matching US capabilities to use nuclear weapons against North Korea. And President Trump has declared that North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. I'm sure you've heard that quote before. And for his part, the leader of North Korea is undeterred. And he has replied to President Trump by saying, and I quote, a frightened dog barks louder. <laughs> And he has claimed that I will surely and definitely tame the mentally deranged US dotard with fire. Now, we should all be concerned when heads of governments armed with nuclear weapons talk to each other like this. And many military experts fear that a war between the United States and North Korea would encompass the entire region. And since both sides have nuclear weapons, the casualties would be unimaginably large. But our speaker today does not believe that this is what the future of East Asia needs to be or should be. Since leaving office, Dr. Hadayama has devoted a great deal of effort to promoting the idea and the goal of an East Asian community modeled on the European Union, which he argues is the most effective and sustainable way to keep the peace and promote prosperity in the region. So the title of his lecture today is From the North Korean Nuclear Crisis to Shaping a New Cooperative Future for East Asia. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Dr. Yukio Hatayama. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. And I don't have to need any more to add it to your speech. But, well, it's a tremendous honor and a great pleasure to speak at Princeton University, one of the world's most esteemed institutions of higher education. I would like to express my gratitude to the Withdraw Wilson School of Public and International Affairs for the opportunity. This is my first visit to the Princeton campus. 48 years ago, I was admitted to the Graduate School of Stanford University, where I earned PhD degree in operation research. In those days, I was also extremely interested in the sport of football and rem remember enjoying playing touch football almost every weekend on the campus lawns. Most of those games were with other Japanese students studying there. If I had competed against the more powerful American students, then I may have departed this world. <laughs> there were around 100 overseas students from Japan at Stanford back then, so it was easy to form teams. Re recently, however, fewer Japanese students are choosing to study abroad. I understand the number of Japanese students here Princeton has been increasing over the past five years. I hope that trend continue. Today, I want to particularly ref reflect upon the history of United States-Japan relations over the years, while discussing what I see as the role of Japan in pursuing
peace and prosperity in East Asia. Allow me to begin with a conclusion. Namely, for the sake of peace and prosperity in East Asia, a community along the lines of the EU in Europe must be created, in other words, an East Asian community. The EU was built through a process that embodied European identity, which itself was based upon the idea of fraternity. My personal desire is to build an East Asian community on the strength of this idea of fraternity. Briefly stated, this is a philosophy of respecting one's own dignity while equally respecting the dignity of others. Many people, however, may have doubts about the viability of such a community. They might cite, for example, the decision of Great Britain to withdraw from the European Union or the strong support Marine Le Pen received in the last French election for arguing France should also depart the EU. They might ask, didn't the monetary and fiscal crisis in Greece meanwhile cause confusion across the EU? Others might believe the current immigrant and refugee situation is undermining the solidarity of the EU. According to this line of thought, even if an East Asian community were created in the image of the EU, it would hardly be likely to function well. To that, I would st state that yes, the EU is facing a number of difficulties. On the other hand, no wars have broken out between member nations. In the past, Germany and France frequently waged wars. Since the EU was launched, however, such wars have vanished from the scene, replaced by the emergence and the stable anti-war consensus. In bringing prosperity to East Asia, therefore, I also want to help form a consensus for a stable anti-war consensus among the nations of East Asia. My desire is to learn from problems in the EU in a positive and construction fashion, constructive fashion. In response, some may say, fine, but hasn't East Asia continued to struggle with North Korea and its ongoing nuclear missile development? They may ask, isn't China determined to dominate the region and replace the United States? Such comments reflect honest doubts about the ability to build a community with such nations on board. That is particularly true of North Korea, and it would be difficult to include Pyongyang in such a regional community from the start. Looking to the future, however, I do not feel that such a move is totally out of the question. As you know, today marks the opening of the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea. In striving to resolve the issue of North Korea's participation in those games, high-level talks were convened between the North and the South for the first time in two years. It was also decided to carry on such complex discussions as well as hold talks between the military authorities in both Koreans in an attempt to eliminate tensions on that front. On that front. In this way, contacts, exchanges, and cooperation between the North and the South in various areas comprised a step forward in resolving the issues on the Korean Peninsula. I believe that Sports provide one of the most effective avenues for easing political tensions. In that same sense, the continuation of these exchanges may very well pave the way to successfully fostering ties of trust between North Korea and the other nations of Asia. 
Up to now, North Korea has continued its nuclear testing program while also testing increasingly capable ballistic missiles. That is certainly not a desirable state of affairs. We must also ask ourselves, however, why Pyongyang has channeled such major efforts into missile development. Simply stated, it is because the United States and North Korea continue to maintain only a ceasefire cease agreement. This means that for all practical purposes, the Korean War has yet to end. To truly bring this long war to an end, a peace treaty must be signed. The judgment of the North Koreans is that to truly negotiate with the United States, which maintains overwhelming strength in terms of nuclear missiles, it is necessary to have nuclear armed missiles capable of reaching American shores. Failure to do so is viewed as leaving the North at a major disadvantage. Late last November, North Korea launched its Fasong 15 missile. With that, it declared that its nuclear arms strength is complete. This means that Pyongyang feels it has effectively developed of missiles capable of reaching America. Many doubts remain about the ability of North Korean missiles equipped with nuclear heads to actually reach US shores. It is significant, however, that they appear to believe that they have achieved such capacity. This also means that the North has basically completed preparations for negotiation with the US in, US. in my opinion, depending upon the terms, there is ample possibility for the North to agree to such talks, demanding that Pyongyang discard its nuclear capacity as a condition for such contact, however, will leave those possibilities unrealized. I believe one condition on which both sides might agree is for the North to freeze its nuclear and missile development program in return for the United States and South Korea holding the joint military exercises for an extended period of time. One intriguing aspect of this concerns the differences in words and actions between President Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Mr. Trump has threatened the North with increasingly severe sanctions and military retaliation. But he went on to say that he also wants to consider all possibilities. Then, upon realization of the North-South talks, Mr. Trump declared his 100% support for South Korean President Moon Jae-in. He also commented to the effect that he wants to personally join such talks in the future. By contrast, Prime Minister Abe has insisted that the time for dialogue is over and continues to push President Trump to place the strongest possible economic sanctions on the North. Thus, even after the sudden decision to hold North-South talks, Mr. Abe continued to urge both the government and the media not give the North any more time to deceive the rest of the world. In that way, he has remained extreme of the ages ashore land-based ballistic missile interception system, along with other high-priced weapons. Mr. Trump, I'm sure, viewed this as a truly lucrative business deal. What I really want to stretch, stress here, though, is the possibility of war. That is, if North Korean leader Kim Jong-un were to launch an attack against the United States, 
there was little doubt that President Trump would retaliate against the North with massive military force and attempt to eliminate Mr. Kim and collapse North Korean regime. Mr. Kim is certainly aware of that stark reality. Therefore, I do not believe that Kim would attack first. If President Trump made the first strike, however, there is no reason to believe that all of the North missile bases could be instantly destroyed. <coughs> there is no doubt that the North would retaliate with its own weaponry. In such a situation, the most probable targets would be the United States military bases in Okinawa, Yokosuka, and other areas of Japan. Yokosuka is quite close to Tokyo, which means that Tokyo itself could be hit. If Prime Minister Abe endorsed such a strategy by President Trump, therefore, there is a very real threat of most anywhere in Japan coming under attack. So if the United States initiated such a war, the United States mainland might go unscathed, while Japan, South Korea, and other nearby areas could be transformed into a sea of flames. What I want everyone to understand, therefore, is that for Japan, a military resolution to this situation is totally out of the question. The only feasible option is a peaceful solution. Despite that, Mr. Abe repeatedly goes on record with his unconditional support of President Trump, including support for a preemptive US attack on North Korea. In my view, the proper course of action for any Japanese leader should be cooperation in arranging conditions aimed at realizing talks between the United States and North Korea. <laughs> Blindly flowing, following the United States, rather than objectively considering what it is in the best interest of Japan or the region, is a Japanese political tradition. There are other important examples. You may not know that Mr. Abe was not always such a big supporter of Mr. Trump. Both Prime Minister Abe and the Japanese government at large were certain that Hillary Clinton would win the 2016 election. Thus, they supported her for president. Mr. Abe was shocked when Mr. Trump emerged victorious. And to make up for that mistake, he wanted to make sure he was the first foreign leader to rush to New York to congratulate President-elect Trump in person. In my eyes, that behavior was truly pitiful. <laughs> From the perspective of Mr. Trump, however, I imagine that he regarded Mr. Abe as someone very easy to handle. <laughs> For Mr. Abe, another major miscalculation was the decision by President Trump to pull the United States out of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The blind faith that Abe placed in the TPP was the natural result of his equally blind dependence on the United States. That was based on the belief that allying with the United States, the leader of the global economy, would also help Japan project a presence as a key world economic power. Abe and Japan thus declared the intent to participate in the TPP, which was being promoted by President Obama, concluding that TPP basically mean, meant that all trade tariffs would be removed without exception. For Japan, certain global companies in the automotive and other fields would benefit from this. But major agricultural produce, dairy and livestock farming, and other sectors would be seriously impacted. 
Japan's health insurance system, which benefits everyone living in my country, would also not be spared. There were fears, in other words, that only the affluent would be able to afford high quality health care. Even more importantly, as a result of the investor state dispute settlement, ISDS, provisions of the TPP, multinational companies would be able to act on their own to litigate against national governments with various regulations. If these multinationals triumphed in special courts, government would be required to pay out large sums of in com compensation. So even though the TPP appeared overwhelmingly advantageous to US multinational firms, the other government followed America's lead on this issue. It never took the time to alert the Japanese people of the details involved and Japan signed the treaty in 2016. As you know, however, while the TPP was supposedly profitable for multinational companies, President Trump declared that the concept was contrary to the interests of United States domestic industry, and he pulled out of the agreement. For Prime Minister Abe, that was a great shock indeed. Regarding the current state of TPP, we have heard from the Japanese side that a general agreement has been reached through negotiations without the United States on board. At the same time, however, Canada does not seem ready to join. If the truth were told, because the TPP without the US is largely an exercise in futility, all of those efforts appear rather fruitless. Japan, which has remained so dependent on the United States, now finds itself at the mercy of this reversal in American intent and policy. As I have said, when determining its foreign policy directions, Japan remains constantly sensitive to United States desires. At times, this even extends to internal politics. For example, in the privatization of Japan's postal services, policy decisions were engineered with United States interest keenly in mind. It boggles my mind why Japanese politics remain so subservient to what Washington wants. The reason for this situation may be traced back to Japan's defeat by the United States in the World War II. Throughout the post-war era, because of the Japan-United States Security Treaty, the majority of Japanese have believed the United States is protecting Japan's peace and security. It is certainly true that for over seven decades, the United States has maintained its military bases in Japan, which are concentrated in Okinawa. This has functioned as a deterrent, deterrent and the Japanese mainland never once become entangled in war during this time. For that, Japan should be deeply grateful to the United States. We must also remember, however, that in a truly realistic perspective, the key significance of this United States basis is certainly not limited to the girding of Japan. In a greater sense, the true role of this presence is to serve as the foundation of the US ability to project military force throughout the far east to Asia, as well as to the Middle East. While Japan has benefited from allowing the United States to use Japan this way, it has also paid important costs. 
Historically, it is extremely rare, rare for the military forces of a foreign country to remain indefinitely inside another sovereign nation in return for upholding the security of that host nation. This may have become possible in this case because the ways in which that host nation conducts itself have come to be determined by the will and whims of the country maintaining its armed forces there. If that is true, then that host can hardly be considered to be a sovereign nation at all. I am a firm believer in the need for Japan to attain the ability to protect its own security on its own without relying upon the United States regardless of how much time required to take that step. Under the current treaty, it is possible for the United States to maintain any scale of troops in Japan that it wishes and to move them when, whenever and wherever it wishes. As long as such an arrangement continues, Japan will never emerge from its unhealthy dependence on the United States. Something vividly underscoring the problems with Japan's indefinite and complete dependence on the United States is the presence of the so-called Japan-United States Joint Committee. I have to admit that when I became prime minister, I was not fully aware of the presence of presence and power of the committee. This body was formed through the Japan-United States Status of Forces Agreement. On the Japanese side, the committee is headed up by the director of the North American Affairs Bureau and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, along with high-ranking bureaucrats from other central government agencies. On the American side, the top person is the vice commander of the US military headquarters in Japan, assisted by high-ranking members of United States Forces Japan and attaches to the US Embassy in Japan. The committee consisting of this rather odd combination of primarily of US military officers and Japanese civil servants convenes two times each month. The contents of those meetings, however, are kept secret. In almost all cases, demands presented by the US side are adopted as is. Believe it or not, because of confidentiality, reports from these meetings are not even issued to the prime minister. As secret understandings, the decisions reached by this committee encompasses, com encompass a presence exceeding the force of Japan's own laws. For example, there is a secret pact on waiving jurisdiction, which states that crimes committed by United States military personnel in Japan are not subject to the administration of local justice, other than in incidents considered conspicuously serious for Japan. <coughs> this means that in the large number of cases, heinous crimes committed by United States military personnel in Japan on duty as well as off duty are not subject to being tried in Japanese court. The net effect is that many crimes are simply overlooked. There are many other daily reminders of the price Japan pays for the controlling presence of the United States military. If you have ever traveled to Japan on a flight through Haneda Airport to Tokyo, you may have
have noticed that aircraft takes a large turnover the airport after taking off and before landing. This is due to what is known as Yokota airspace, space that is under the jurisdiction of Yokota Air Force Base in the north of Tokyo. Japanese aircraft are unable to fly freely in the broad airspace over the greater Tokyo metropolitan area. The reason is that this space is exclusively reserved for U.S. combat plane training miss missions. Behind this seemingly small but telling indignity is yet another secret pact entered into by the Japan-United States Joint Committee. Under this system, Japanese government officials who attend meetings of the Japan-US Joint Committee receive promotions. For such senior bureaucrats, rising through the ranks is the ultimate incentive. It is not surprising, therefore, that almost all of these Japanese bureaucrats remain subservient to the United States. As noted, the legal basis for this committee lies in the status of foreign force, status of forces agreement, which I feel should be revised. When I was prime minister, I searched for ways to rework that agreement, but the bureaucrats negotiating with the United States side informed me that adjusting the agreement would be difficult and that they prefer to simply make improvements in its application. In reflection, I still have serious doubt that the degree to which they truly set their minds to negotiating such terms. I became Japan's prime minister in September of 2009. Unfortunately, I resigned less than nine months later. The single greater, greatest reason for that outcome was the issue surrounding the location of Temo Air Station, one of the US military bases in Okinawa. I was unable to live up to the wishes of the people of Okinawa by finding an off-island location for that base. As it turned out, I returned to the original plan for location at Henoko within Okinawa as determined by the previous administration. With some 70% of US forces in Japan concentrated in Okinawa, and with a plan underway to transfer one of the local bases to a separate site. My desire was to at least move that one facility off of Okinawa. I failed in that mission and ended up resigning as a result. Naturally, this was due to my own limited abilities. There was also talk, however, about how another reason was pressure applied from the US side. That, however, is simply not correct. The truth, rather, is that the Japanese bureaucrats involved in those talks were known for using their own standards to summarize the wishes of their United States counterparts, failed to carry out my policy wishes as expressed, as expressed. It is important for Americans to understand the situation in Okinawa, which lies at the far southwestern portion of the Japanese island. The, perf the prefecture closest to China and Taiwan. Its numerous islands are surrounded by lovely ocean waters and precious coral reefs. It attracts many tourists all year round. Okinawa is small, about one-tenth the size of the state of New Jersey, accounting for a mere 0.6% of Japan's total land. 
Despite that, as I said before, it contains a concentration of some 70% of the US military bases in Japan. Many of these bases in Okinawa belong to the US Marine Corps. US forces conduct a wide range of training activities in Okinawa, and those activities have resulted in a number of accidents and incidents. Last year alone, there were seven serious incidents, including the crash of an Osprey vertical takeoff and landing aircraft in the local ocean, and a helicopter bursting into flames. The year before last, former, a former United States Marine working as a civilian employee of the US military in Okinawa raped and murdered a local woman. In 1995, a group of United States soldiers in Okinawa gang raped an elementary school girl. As you can imagine, that triggered an angry uproar among the residents. That situation led to an agreement to return one United States Marine Corps facility, the Stemma, the Stemma Air Station, to Japan. As a condition for this move, however, the United States side insisted on relocating the station's helicopter functions to a separate site in Okinawa. The prefecture found this difficult to swallow, and the standoff dragged on for years. In 2004, a US helicopter crashed on the campus of Okinawa International University, which is located adjacent to Temma. Two years later, the United States proposed the current proposed solution, the construction of a bridge shaped runway in the village of Henoko. Again, however, no final decision was really forthcoming. forthcoming. In 2009, when my political party took control of the government, while campaigning for prime minister, I made a public pledge to reduce the military burden on Okinawa by moving that replacement site outside of the prefecture. As I explained earlier, however, I was unable to fulfill that commitment. On the issue of the location to Henoko, the positions of Akina Prefecture and the Japanese national government are directly opposed. Tokyo insists that Henoko is the only feasible site and is moving ahead with that construction work. In reality, though, Henoko is not the only option, nor is it by any means the best option. You may not know that Henoko is one of the most beautiful seaside spots in all of Japan. More importantly, the place where they were to build the new airstrip is a coral reef that is the habitat for a rare marine species known as the dugon. And just for good measures, the proposed construction site lies near an active earthquake fault line, further promoting comments that the location is totally inappropriate for a runway. runway. In addition to all this, some experts have expressed the view that the planned 1,800 meter runway is too short for use in emergencies. Other criticisms include that in the view of how war is waged today, the very reason for the continued presence of the US Marine Corps in Okinawa is not nearly as great as it once was. It is my understanding that debate is also underway within the United States and that a considerable portion of the troops stationed on Okinawa having already been decided to be relocated to the islands of Guam and Kenyan. Regarding 
the remaining Marine Corps forces there with rotation to other locations, most likely only a matter of time. There would seem to be no pressing need to build a new base now. To those of you gathered here today, I would greatly appreciate your interest and concern on the issue of United States military bases in Okinawa. It would be wonderful, there, furthermore, to benefit from your ideas and other support in convincing the United States government to agree to working out a solution that better reflects the settled sentiment of the people of who live there. The challenges of building an East Asian community, resolving the crisis in North Korea, and rebalancing sovereign relations between the United States and Japan are all tied to question about China. As we all know, China has achieved rapid growth and development in recent years. In terms of its GDP, it is now close to three times that of Japan. And because of the sheer size of China's population, it is likely to surpass the United States GDP in the not so distant future. Prime Minister Abe is well known for his belief that China is a menace, although it must be said that he has walked back some of his anti-China rhetoric recently. There are three key reasons Mr. Abe believes China is the threat to Japan. The first is a territorial dispute with China over the Senkak Island. This is a group of tiny islands over which Japan has maintained administrative control for a long time. <coughs> My personal view is that while China claims territorial rights over those isles, Beijing would stand to achieve no real gains by actually taking them over. Thus, I feel that it might be possible to reshelve this particular dispute as China and Japan managed to do so for many decades until the controversy was brought front and center by nationalists in both countries, especially in Japan, in recent years. The second issue is the growth in Chinese defense spending. The key question is whether it represents a troubling change in China's national priorities. According to the annual independent assessment of global military expenditure provided by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, China has held defense spending constant at approximately 2% of GDP since 1988. As China's GDP began to approach the size of Japan's, so did the scale of its military expenditures. As China's GDP becomes larger than Japan's, some degree of concern is understandable. But China is not devoting a greater percentage of its national resources to defense spending. It simply has more resources overall, including more resources to spend on its military. The third reason underlying Abe's view of China as a menace is China's island building activities in the South China Sea. Regular strategic dialogues between the United States and China and the participation of China in joint naval exercises with the United States in the Pacific suggests China is not on a path that ends with Chinese domination of the South China Sea or an effort to exclude the United States or challenge the freedom of navigation of Japan or any other nation. Moreover, China and the other parties 
to the various territorial disputes are working through a regional institution, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, to draw up a legally binding code of conduct. When all is said and done, therefore, I believe that this is an issue that can and should be resolved by the contesting parties themselves. A little over two months ago, I had an opportunity to take part in discussions with Chinese President Xi Jinping. On that occasion, President Xi reiterated many of the themes that are shaping China's foreign policy. He said, the human race is a community bound together by a common destiny. Even if China becomes a major power, therefore, we have no intention of seeking hegemony. Historically, such action is simply not in our genes. We will be advancing all foreign policy matters in a peaceful manner. He added with particular emphasis, we intend to get along with get along well with our neighbors. The question was, the, the question we face is whether we can pull our faith in these words from present Xi. The best way is to, the, the best way to find out is by opening ourselves to the possibility that he means what he says, a possibility Mr. Abe because of his prejudices is not even willing to consider, given its size and importance of China to the future of East Asia and the world, every possible effort must also be devoted to fostering a constructive dialogue between Japan and China, where our governments can discover roles of resolution for the complica complicated issues that trouble our relationship. Over the past few years, President Xi has commented on the idea of an East Asian community a number of times. In South Korea, as well, there is a considerable number of Diet members and intellectuals who endorsed this vision. The ASEAN 10 nations have already taken steps in that direction, forming an economic force cost union in 2015. As such examples serve to suggest an East Asia community is no longer a pipe dream, I feel that it is only a matter of time until it is realized. After I stepped down from the post of Prime Minister, Japan has remained the only Asian nation to not comment upon the possibility of East Asian community. Perhaps this is because of deference to the United States. When I first proposed that concept, there was criticism from some in the United States government who saw it as an effort to exclude the US from Asia. I certainly never conceived of it that way. While this would be a partnership focused on East Asian nations, it would also be kept fully open to all nations wishing to join. That is because this community would not function like the custom unions of the past, which erected high barriers for trade. The goal, rather, is to form the type of war-renouncing community that I mentioned earlier. For that reason, I would welcome the United States with open arms. If the misunderstandings of America can be resolved, with Japan taking a forward-thinking approach, a free trade agreement signed between Japan, China, and South Korea, and other progress made, an East Asian community would become a working reality. 
I also wish to discuss the significance of an East Asian community from another perspective. Let's consider the current global situation. With the dramatic spread of the internet, we have entered an era characterized by increasingly free flows of people, commodities, money, and information across national and regional borders. For the majority of people, this has ushered in tremendous convenience. Yet, at the same time, the cultivation of neoliberalism in the wake of globalism resulted in the loss of the spirit of fraternity. It also led to extremely widening gaps in wealth between different nations and within individual nations themselves. These trends are also connected to the breakdown of the middle class, the segment of our societies most able to serve as the key bulwark of democracy over the years. The dissatisfaction with politics by persons in this income category has stirred up a virtual storm of anti-globalism with the world moving into a period of period marked by the abnormal expansion of nationalism. Criticism of the unfettered movement of commodities has spawned the America first battle cry of President Donald Trump. Another example of such fallout is the Brexit withdrawal of Great Britain from the European Union. Challenges posed by the constant flow of immigrants and refugees are having a serious impact on EU nations. In Russia, the rise in nationalism fueled by economic sanctions against Moscow linked to the struggles in the Ukraine and Crimea is boosting support for President Putin. In Japan, Prime Minister Abe seems in, intent on leveraging Japan's democracy on the United States to unleash a distinctive Japanese brand of nationalism. I certainly subscribe to the need to correct the excesses of globalism. Leaning too far toward nationalism, however, will predictably heighten tensions between nations. For my part, I would like to suggest regionalism, which stresses the importance of harmony <laughs> with other nations in the area as a trade-off between globalism and nationalism. The East Asian community is a concrete idea I have proposed that moves us in that direction. Another ex existing proposal of this kind of regionalism is the Belt and Road Initiative championed by China's President Xi. That vision seeks to transform the Eurasian continent into a common faith community via infrastructure building. As a highly rational means of contributing to global peace and prosperity, I propose the following approach. Advanced dialogue and cooperation with neighboring countries through the spirit of fraternity, thereby accumulating a steady series of discussions spanning vastly ranging economic, political, and society themes. This serves to strengthen the bonds of trust in building up regional communities. While it may sound somewhat idealistic, if the number of such regional communities increases and overlaps, they could eventually come to stretch around the globe. Such an achievement would greatly raise the opportunities and expectations for genuine world peace. Regarding Japan, I believe it is possible for the Japanese to act on their own to identify the road to be traveled from here on. For Japan to become a truly sovereign nation, 
It needs to emerge from its current state of dependence on the United States. And the practice of constant sensitivity to the United States nations, uh, United States notions in determining domestic policies. Toward that end, the scale of the United States military basis on which Japan is so dependent, and particularly those in Okinawa, must be reduced. When that happens, Japan must act on its own to preserve the nation's security. I am not referring, however, to any absolute need to raise the strength of our self-defense forces. Rather, I believe Japanese security can be advanced through the soft power of greater dialogue and deeper cooperation with neighboring nations, thereby raising the level of mutual trust. In short, I do not see a viable road ahead for a so-called Great Japan approach in which our military strength is bolstered. On the contrary, I reject any remnants of this Great Japan thinking and its net methods. In its place, I am proposing the promotion of an East Asian community. If that can be achieved, Japan will emerge able to recapture the trust it entered and it enjoyed in the past and come to once again be admired and relied upon by people around the world. I realize that those of you studying at Princeton University may not have paid all that much attention to Japan up to now. Even if that is the case, I suspect you have realized that my thinking differs widely from that of the existing administration of Prime Minister Abe, which is largely rooted in the concept of dependence on the subordination to the United States. For many in the United States, it may be actually seems preferable for as many nations as possible to obedient, obediently adhere to the leadership of President Trump. In that regard, I would suggest that while all sovereign nations owe it to themselves to pay ample notice to the voices of countries with which they are friendly, they must also maintain their own independent policies. Moreover, it is certainly not true that the directions indicated by all national leaders are correct and acceptable. For the relations between America and Japan, for example, I look forward to the day when we emerge from the current relationship of subordination and instead forge ties of genuine fraternity based upon the critical combination of sovereignty and coexistence. Richard Nicholas von Kudenhof Kalergi, an Austrian whose mother was Japanese, promote, promoted the importance of fraternity in the first half of the 20th century. He expounded extensively upon the ideas inherent in fraternity and also came to be known as the father of the European Union. I have always been particularly moved by the following thoughts expressed by Kudenhof Kalergi. Man is an end and not a means. The state is a means and not an end. The value of the state is exactly the value of its services to human beings. In so much as it serves to develop man, it is good. So soon as it hinders the development of man, it is evil. In my view, the idea of fraternity is critical in any attempt to create organizations that function as national states. The political essentials for fraternity, meanwhile, may be seen as the consequences of effective federal organizations, in other words, communities. In conclusion, it is my most profound hope that 
we will never see the world integrated through military force, but rather through communities driven by the thoughts and dreams of fraternity. As a closing thought, allow me to offer yet another example of the ever hopeful and enlightened mindset of Richard Nicholas von Kudenhof Kalesby. Every great happening began as an utopia and ended as a reality. Thank you very much for listening. We have time for um, a few questions, and if you have a question you would like to ask, could you please line up at the two microphones that are here? So we'll take the first question. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just had a question about um, the strategy to approaching North Korea. Um, we've been kind of pursuing this on and off peace talk process since the mid 90s, and it doesn't seem to have done much good. So I'm wondering why an additional peace talk now, why you think this, this would be different? Sorry for Japanese. <laughs> uh, well, interpreter is here. <laughs> so, no problem. あの、平和に向けての交渉をこれまで続けてきたという話でありますが、私は北朝鮮が核ミサイルを放棄しなければ交渉に応じないと米国側が要求する限りにおいてはこれからもなかなか平和の交渉が進まないと思っています。したがって何らか日本や韓国あるいは中国が仲介をしてアメリカと北朝鮮が交渉のテーブルに着く
Uh, first question is, although you have great policy disagreements with President Trump, in terms of a governing approach, for example, challenging the, na the national bureaucracy, uh, cutting, civil, cutting civil service hiring, questioning traditional security alliances, and calling for a more independent foreign policy, and also a populist economic position, for example, tax cuts. Uh, there's, there are some similarities between you and President Trump. So looking back at your successes, but also your, your challenges and failures as prime minister, what advice would you give to the Trump administration? Uh, yes. Uh, second question is. あの、どんなアドバイスがありますでしょうか。セカンド。あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、
Hello? Yep. Go ahead. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I have one question for Hatayama, um, and it is, given the recent elections with Koike and Kibo no To and Ishi no Kai, as well as Jimin To, it appears that conservatism, or Minzo Kushugi, is very popular in Japan currently. Now, in your personal opinion, what do you think the likeliness of your proposal will get public support? There seems to be a tide that a lot of people are going for more conservative, more backwards kind of uh, policies as well as politicians. And so that's the question I just wanted to ask. ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、ですね、
いますので、憲法の中に書き入れることは、それは可能と思いますが、ただ、私は安倍首相がこのことをきっかけとして、さらにいわゆる国家の権限を強めていく方向に、憲法を改正、変えていく可能性があると、懸念があると思っています。その方向に向かうための一席だとすれば、反対をせざるを得ないのではないかと考えています。Under the current constitution,、um, it is possible to make Japan independent from the US.、Um, it, it would not、uh, be unconstitutional. However,、um, it would uh, require uh, reviewing uh, uh, fundamentally the、uh, Japan US Security Treaty as well as the、um, uh, arm, Arms Forces uh, uh, Agreement.、Um, And regarding the、um, Article 9, what、uh, Mr. Abe has in his mind is that、uh, no one in the past has been able to change the Constitution.、Um, so it doesn't really matter what he's changing, he wants to change the Constitution, amend the Constitution. And the easiest approach is、uh, regarding the self defense force.、Uh, self defense force is、uh, um, already accepted by the people.、Uh, people know that they do a very good job. Um, so, um, his idea is to, to add the、um, awarding of、uh, self defense force、uh, positioning in the、um, a position in the Constitution.、Um, and of course, it is possible to do that. But what I'm concerned is that、um, Mr. Abe's、um, idea, if it is,、um, to start out with this uh, uh, small amendment. And to go forward with the、uh, further amendment of the Constitution to even further strengthen the authority of the, the, the government. And if it's the first step towards that effort, then、um, I、uh, do have to be against the idea of amending the Constitution. So, can we take the next two questions together? And that'll be the end of the questions, I'm afraid. Thank you so much for being here today. Kind of going off of the same idea that the Abe administration is interested in strengthening the self defense force, and it seems more likely that the self defense force may be strengthened,、um, what do you think this would do to the prospect of having an East Asian community, given that not all of the、uh, nations or the countries in the area really seem to trust Japan? At the moment, considering Japan's history? And what kind of, should the self defense force be strengthened? What kind of <coughs> measures should Japan take to kind of rebuild that trust within the East Asian community? Thank you. I'm sorry. National, I mean,、uh, regionalism and possibly expanding regionalism. Do you see any good or bad effect that the United Nations may have on, on your plan, or no effect at all? United Nations. The United Nations, any, any United Nations help or harm that this could cause? Thank you. おっしゃる通り、安倍首相は自衛隊を憲法の中に書き入れると、そのこと自体が問題なのではなくて、それによって、えー、いわゆる集団的自衛権を認めていますから、どんどんと自衛隊を海外に派遣しやすくするという意図を持っていると思います。私はそのことは憲法に書くのではなくて、自衛隊法などできちんと
自衛隊を、まあ、憲法の中に規定をすること以上に自衛隊の法律の中でより規制をさせる必要があるということとそれからやはり集団的自衛権の行使を容認できるような法律はこれは将来の政権によってもう一度葬らなければならない集団的自衛権はやはり行使をするべきではないと思っておりますすなわち周辺諸国にやはり脅威を与えるということでございますそれから私は国連は確かに存在をしてすべての国家が協力をしているわけでありますけれどもなかなか国連は規模が大きすぎて重要な案件を迅速に決めることが難しいと思っていますで私は自分が考えている共同体の目的がこの経済以上に周辺,周辺諸国との間で決して二度と戦争しないような環境を作るということでありますからこの共同体のをですねさらにオーバーラップさせて地球全体をいくつかのこの共同体で埋め尽くすような発想をすることを考えていますとそれができればそれは私はある意味で国連の役割を助けることになると思っておりまして決して国連に対して障害になるものではないと確信をしています。Yes, as you said,、um, a self defense force,、um, addition of self defense force existence to the Constitution itself is not、um, a much of an issue. However,、uh, that would lead to、um, accepting the co、um, collective defense right. And the, the intention was to make it more easy to、uh, send out troops to, or self defense forces to overseas. And if that was the purpose, then、uh, rather than adding the, the words to Constitution, I believe that it should be added to the self defense laws or、um, laws regarding the self defense forces.、Um, in the future, the future administration should eliminate the, the law that would allow for collective defense r i g h t We should not execute collective defense r i g h t、uh, This will be a threat to neighboring countries. Now, regarding the United Nations,、uh, it is a, a platform for many countries to participate and collaborate. However, at the same time, because of its sheer size, the United Nations has some difficulties in making quick decisions on very important issues.、Um, and the community that I'm proposing, its purpose is、uh, more than economic purposes.、Um, I, want to I want the community to create an environment where there will never be a war. Um, if um, all these communities、um, cover the entire earth and maybe they may overlap, then、um, I think it would、um, support the activities of the、uh, United Nations rather than hampering them. So、um, please join me in thanking our speaker.